What's up, OG? What's good, bro? So, uh, got to watch a football game over the weekend. What, do you like what you saw? Yes, I really did. Uh, so the Ravens play that game where they just don't lose uh, preseason games, and that's fine. I have no issue whatsoever with that. Uh, it's it's not a big deal to me. I knew the Eagles weren't going to win. I know the Harbaugh got Harbaugh is, and uh, them not winning the game was fine. Uh, my my one annoyance is penalties because Nick Sirianni started off two seasons and both seasons have started off with penalties, dumb penalties. Now I know Barnett's like 90% of them. And I, and I get that part of it. You know, this training camp, he's come in, uh, Mr. Perfect, gotta be perfect, gotta be perfect. So you see, he knows it's an issue and he seems to be, uh, uh, nailing in on it. But even in the preseason game, it started off with them having a little bit of issues with that. What, what do you think about that? Um, in a, in a way, in a lot of ways, I'm looking at discipline in that situation, whereas though, if you look at the game, the game started off with a penalty. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, you want to see that at this stage of the game because it's, it's called, you know, they, they want them to be focused, you know, coming into this game and you're not focused, then you obviously, that's not where you want to be at as a, as a head coach because he knows that, that that's his job. And um, but what I'm looking at at Nick Sirianni, I'm seeing him put a little bit more pressure on himself than I think he should at this point. And I think it's because of the Super Bowl and losing it, and that he kind of want to try to channel his his emotions and his energy, but then try to make us or we want the media to know that he's not really tripping on it, but he's really tripping on. It. So, I think the media has a lot to do with it. I think that knowing that. It's training camp and everybody's just hungry for football. And so though it's not public uh, practices anymore, there's still eyeballs out there. You know, I got the LA Shore Parks, you know, and, and other reporters and things like that. And so when he, we talked to him before, like when he's yelling at your quarterback, like I, I know that my quarterback is the most mature guy on the dang dumb team, coach secluded. I feel like he's being more assertive also because new offensive coordinator, new defensive coordinator, and that's where he felt comfortable with the other leadership. You know, that's why he could relinquish the play calling. Now he doesn't have those crutches to lean on. And it's back to him having to be A1. So I feel like he's like really going for the gusto or nailing down and being, trying to be hard news. And I'm like, okay, dude, I, I know. It doesn't feel right when I see his expression like that so much. Because he's more of a reaction in the moment kind of guy. Like when you see him sometimes on the sideline, he's great aged out. And it'll bring it back down. But it just seems like he's going super hardcore this season. This offseason to me. So it feels a little weird for him. Yeah. Um, I think that has a lot to do with experience as being a, a, being a head coach. And now this is like, what, his third year. Okay. Um, so that should kind of subside itself as he goes, as he grows and get better. You know, but like I said, he's, he's really haven't been in the league or been in that position long enough to really be master any part of the game, you know? So he's really got to find his, his comfort level, you know what I'm saying? As a head coach. And I don't know that he fully embraces the fact that he's more of a John Harbaugh type of coach. You know, I think he wants to be more, more than that, but he is though the type of office that we run. He's not experienced at that, that his, his quarterback is more experienced in the office than he is. So there's not much he can give over in that department. He obviously can't give you nothing on defense. You see what I'm saying? Because he was, what, a quality control coach first, then a wide receiver coach the next year. And then that next year, he became the offense coordinator, which he didn't call him out one play, and he wasn't the architect of the offense. So he really don't have a place. I think he's still trying to find himself as an head coach. And that's what – you know, uh, that soliloquy bridges all of you like, uh, he's not getting enough respect in the league as being a top coach. A lot of other guys have come up in a different way. Like even the younger guys, the Sean McVay, like he was calling plays. He, he had multiple more jobs and opportunities at even a younger age. So Nick Sirianni basically coming out of nowhere and not having certain positions of authority makes people say, okay, you got to the Super Bowl. 
with a light schedule. Hey, you were three points within winning it. Great. Do it again, and then we'll give you all the respect you deserve. And that's where I feel like with Nick Sirianni. I, in the NFC, I believe he's one of the top three coaches because the NFC is weak. As far as the league's concerned, he's got to earn his right to be in that top five category of coaches. And this year, I believe he'll be able to do that. Yeah, possibly. Um, again, I put him in the same uh, mode as uh, John Harbaugh, which you, you've seen how he has to, uh, you know, actually accomplish his experience and his credit that was given. And it was the same way with him. You know what I'm saying? No one uh, selected him as this top coach, you know, early on. You know, it took him took him quite a few years to get that uh, rating. But even Harbaugh had, he, at least he had control of special teams. And it sounds dumb to say that I'd put special teams over a wide receiver coach. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it, it, it it's a very close comparison. But it, the only thing I think about when you keep saying Harbaugh, it reminds me of how much Nick talks about his brother and his family being a football family. Mm-hmm. The Harbaugh's are a football family, like you know. So it, it's 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 very similar. But even even on that road, he still is under Mark as far as uh, his accomplishments until now. Like I said, but he, going forward, he's going to earn what he earns a, and get the respect he he deserves, showing what he can do. Him giving up the play calling and all that kind of stuff just took a couple notches back away from him. But I give him credit for knowing that he couldn't do everything. Because I, I feel like he's too emotional to be wrapped up in that. Like, just from watching him on the sidelines, like, you know, again, I don't want to disrespect my coach, but like, dude, you, you ride emotions really hard. And that's not the kind of guy you want to say, go for it on fourth and three, or we're going to, it's just, it just doesn't work out. So I'm giving that up. I feel it's a good thing. And we're going to see how it works out this year. Yeah. Uh, what stood out to you uh, during the game, the preseason game? Um, the speed, the speed that the, the Philadelphia Eagles that we had, that we have on this team, this is by far the fastest team we've ever had. Um, the talent level, you know, uh, the D backs, man, we are so deep at defensive back. Um, it's going to be hard to cut any one of these guys. So I think when it comes time to cutting, we're going to have to really do something that's orthodox in terms of keeping more D backs defensive backs than we do linebackers because if you look at it um the linebackers are not as good so if we're going to do some cuts I don't want to do the cuts according to position I think and, and with special teams being uh taking it back in terms of responsibility and play you're not really covering punts now and you're not really covering kicks now so you don't really need those linebackers those reserve linebackers to be running down on the kick. You can actually use the D backs to do that. And and in turn, you're you're saving the player that you really don't want another team to pick up. So you're able to hold on to them by putting them where you're holding them on and making a roster spot for special teams and what have you. And then you'll have your ones that you could put on the practice squad. But I think we're going to keep it's going to be a historic move this year in terms of how many defensive backs we keep this year, you know, but I already got my first cuts, at least five of them. Yeah. And my thing about that is how he's always done a really good job of hiding guys in the practice squad. It's rare that our guys get picked up and taken away that we care about. I don't know what kind of relationship he's got going on. I don't know what he's putting in their pocket, but the fact that like we've been able to call up ward and, and, and those guys that we just keep bringing up with this, popping back down to practice squad and they're always available for us when we need them. And we've needed them the last four or five years off and on uh, guys coming up and down from the practice squad. So I feel like how he does a really good job of stashing guys so they don't get picked up by somebody else. Um, so that part, I'm not super worried about, like I guess with the cuts, I hear what you're saying, all that makes sense. But I, that is another thing that Howie is really good at. I, I don't know what he does, but there's so many times you watch other things and they're like, Oh, they picked a guy from practice squad and, and and our guys just sit there and they're, they're there for when we need them. And then they come and show out, you know, uh, Ward had a great game because um, of injury. He got to play in the preseason game and uh, he was showing out. Uh, you know, who wasn't showing out in the preseason. Game? Who was that? Marcus Mariota. Marcus Mariota. Why did they give that man six million dollars? Yeah, I'm upset. Well, uh, let me say this here. 
um, in defense of Marcus Mariota. He's been in the league nine years now, and in the nine years, he's learned eight eight different offenses. So basically, what you're going to have to do is going to have to be a little bit patient with him and allow him to actually embrace something that he was familiar with from college. This is the first time he's been in a, off, a college style offense that you know, such as what we run. They ran the same type of offense at, at Oregon when they did uh, when he played there. So I kind of want to give him a little bit more time just to be able to get himself acclimated with this because when you've when you've learned eight, eight different offenses in in nine years, now your brain is trained to look at certain things from a different you know light, and some of those eight could have been uh, can uh, could have been comparable to others you know what i'm saying but this one here is totally different so he has to re relearn himself this type of offense and like i was telling uh the gentleman that i was speaking with about this particular issue that we talked about now uh yesterday is that yes the receivers he he as a quarterback has to be able to just throw a good ball and if you look at his play in that preseason game he had a couple of overthrows you know and it wasn't misfires the misfires is if he was misfiring, I would be more concerned because then that tells you that he's not grasping the offense. But what he did is he he made the right decision. The ball just wasn't, you know, on point. So that can that there usually adjust that and 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 work with that. But what I what you can work is if the guy is not picking up the offense. If that makes any sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. And I don't give a ham sandwich about none of that. None of that. I don't care. I know. I just see I'm, I'm biased because I watched him in this quarterback little documentary crap that they had going on. And I watched a quitter this team to go hang out with the newborn baby. And I love babies, too. I'd love to go home and hang out with the wife and kid. But I'm saying he, for eight years in the league at this point, you should be able to see a wide open guy and hit the guy. And I know it's a backup line. I, I just know that what they said about him before is what I saw in the preseason game. He was ready to break out and run at an instant. He wasn't looking down the field. The things you complain about young quarterbacks, he was doing that. He was like, just out. And I'm like, bro, it's preseason. Why are you scared now? Why are you scared now? So I, he's there, and that's fine. Uh, but my boy uh, Tanner was out here dropping dimes. My boy Tanner was dro- accuracy, just throwing the ball. And now what happens is, you know, when you have Jalen Hurts and the, the RPO and the, the style offense that we run, uh, Mariota could be useful to that because he does still have wheels. He does still have good elusive instincts and and know how to move right. But I just want you to be able to also get the ball down the field and, and throw the ball with some accuracy. So, you know, I know that Tanner is not the guy you want behind that, but I, I, I just I don't feel comfortable with it. But also, knock on wood, that the only time jail is not playing is what we're wrestling him in uh, late games, fourth quarter, which isn't going to be that much this year. Last year, he got a lot of rest uh, early in games, but uh, this year I think we're going to be playing wire to wire to get to get these wins. So uh, I hear everything you just said, and I get I get it, but I don't like it. I don't feel comfortable with it. But they gave him six million dollars, so he ain't going nowhere. And the only joy and comfort I have is that, like I said, that kid Tanner. It was Tanner time. He the first throw he had over the shoulder, dropped in the basket. I'm like, okay, that was nice. Again. You take that for what it's worth, right? He's going against the third string, and I would say this here: when with a player like Tanner, the, the reason why you you may look at him and see that he's more accurate, he's supposed to be basically because he's a thrower. Yeah, you know I'm saying he's not a highly mobile guy like a Marcus Mariota and a Jalen Hurts. So those guys rely more on their overall game than their arm and their accuracy. So you will see. And that is just there. He may, he will, those type of guys like a Nick Foles would be more accurate than a, a um, you know, athletic uh, quarterback such as um, Mariota and Jalen Hurts. But, you know, again, either way, if either one of them touches the field when we actually, you know, don't need this, not a good thing. So I don't think we're going to win with either one of them. No. Um, I mean, but depending on how the team to look, how loaded the team is in the games they might be at, it is the thing. But the schedule's harder, so you're right about that. It's not going to really matter. Uh, special teams, I want a new punter. I want a new punter. And I know I, the, the, I can't remember his name. It's because he has such a good nickname. 
the punk guy that was on the bills that had legal issues and they cut him and his legal issues have been resolved. Uh, all the court stuff is done. Like he was found innocent, whatever, whatever. He's just sitting out there on somebody's couch and everybody's afraid to get him. Philadelphia is known to give guys a second chance and, and work with people. And I don't know what other punters were available. But go give me a punter. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, with this guy, uh, this is a reason why he's still out there. Oh, I'm sure. He's actually facing a uh, civil suit. Oh, is he got a civil suit now? now? Okay. Um, I don't know that an organization want to tie their 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 horses to that wagon at this point. I mean, you talk about the abuse of a woman, a gang alleged gang rape, Al- alleged. Yeah. yeah. So that's not a that's not a good look uh, anyway. And then even someone hired someone that was even because you obviously in order for your name to be risen, you was at the very least you were there. Yeah. So I I would stay away from it. I don't need a guy to punt a ball that that bad where I want to mortgage my morals. For that. Then they can go find me another punter somewhere. Yes, I mean that's that's awesome. I I feel like they I feel like they don't even pay attention to special teams, and it's starting to irk me. They extend this guy who no one really likes as a special teams coach. I guess you want to keep somebody around. My thing is if you're you're overhauling the whole offensive defense court, you might as well go get me a new special teams guy too. At that point, at this moment, you know what I mean, like trying to keep some continuity with that, where that was like the weakest part of your team last year, and extending him again. I, I'll say now, I mean, how he knows more than I know, and and it's okay, but I, I just don't like it, and I don't like the way it feels. So I hear you saying, go had, go yeah. find me a punter somewhere. I had major problems with bringing uh, my, it's Michael Clay, I believe your name. Yeah, I have major problems bringing him back. Um, I don't know, I not, I I do know. It ain't that hard to find a special teams coach, okay? <laughs> and that could do a much better job than we did there. I mean, everybody want to um, say Britton Covey wasn't impressive. Britton Covey was very impressive. He didn't yeah. put the ball on the carpet not one time. No. That's very, very difficult for a rookie to do. You know what I'm saying? So, And then when I look at the running lanes, everybody said he did it. I didn't see a whole lot of lanes open for him in which to run through. And when you say that to somebody, there's like, oh, I'm like, okay. Every once in a while, you'll see a magical move where somebody dips in between three people. Yeah. But most of your runbacks are lane driven, like a guy who can see a lane, hit a lane, and go. But if there's no lane for you, if you're letting everybody pass you, and by the time I get the ball, there's six people in my face, you're right. At least he didn't fumble the ball because there were times where he would get lit up. That means you're letting people through too quickly and you're not protecting the lanes or the rundown. So, yeah. Uh, that, that we'll we'll see how that works out. Hopefully, you know, with um different uh players, uh some younger guys, some hungrier guys down there that are trying to make their bones. You know, special teams could do that for you. So, I uh, will see how that goes. You uh heard about practice yesterday with the Eagles. What did you think about practice yesterday with the Browns? Yeah, I'm very excited. Um, I had a guy on Twitter uh as a Cowboy um fan that said that mm-hmm. um. It's funny that the Eagles uh, said something. It's funny that the Eagles are looking at Dallas's um, uh, camp uh, pre-season plays and and say, "Oh, it's not a big deal." He said, "But you know, but with the Eagles um, uh, practices, everybody is like all excited about it." So he's saying that he's watching, and I'm like, "Dude, relax." The reason why the Eagles fans are more excited about the practice and the train and, and practices is because we're looking at our at new players on our defense that we haven't seen play at at all. So, yeah, we're exci- overly excited because this is the first time we get to see these new players. So it's not like we're overhyping it. It's just that you're seeing a player that you were excited to see play actually play. So normally you're going to get excited about that. Well, that fool just said that Dak Prescott's thrown 92 interceptions against his own team because everybody gets excited about everything as soon as football starts. And if you're a real fan base, people care about these games. They care about these practices. I mean, preseason, people are buying these overpriced tickets to go watch Jews essentially practice light at games. And they're taking their family because they're a little bit more affordable than regular season games. So I'm looking right now. The Ravens game, they're pretty much sold out. You know what I mean? For a preseason practice game that you knew the Ravens were going to win no matter what. So don't tell me, oh my gosh, we're we're too excited about camp or practices because this is where you do get to see the young guys. This is where 
you do get to find out, you know, if the new OC is doing whatever you think they're going to do and, and things that. Like that. And, uh, you know, we here we got Elliot Shore Parts who records and charts every single sack, tackle, and interception. You know, I now started a, a movement across the nation as far as people tracking these things. And because normally they, they didn't care, you just do your eye test and go on about your day. But yesterday, the Eagles went in, and it was funny because, like I said, I, I had a couple friends there, and I, I was watching E-Rock post pictures. Everybody was honky-dory and hugging and hanging out and taking pictures and doing the deal. And it was, you know, our old coach was there, the defense coordinator, and everybody was like, oh, la da And the Eagles apparently got whooped in practice, in, in, the, <laughs> in the practice. And uh, today <laughs> was the exact opposite. The Eagles were very dominant. Uh, three picks on Deshaun Watson over the last two days by Blankenship. A, a Blankenship is out here. I, oh, let me finish my statement and come back to Blankenship. So today they came out with a fur, which is what's going to happen when you play against the Eagles for a season. Everybody's going to be trying to give you their best shot. And yesterday that the Browns came a little harder because, you know, again, they're playing the Eagles. The Eagles are like, oh, okay, cool. Now we're going to get back and focus and stop hugging and, and all that kind of stuff. The fo- fight broke out. You know, Barnett was in the mix like he always is, causing problems. But I like that, 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 that they can switch that mode and realize what they needed to do because there are a lot of young guys. And before I let you talk, I love blanket shit. Last year when I saw him come in on his first play, I saw him light somebody up. And I actually was with my boy. I was like, yeah. I was like, okay, okay. And then the very next defensive play got an interception. I, I told you. I told him, I've been watching that boy since birth. I knew he was going to be good. I knew. <laughs> so I, I like Blake and Shabbat. Uh, what do you got on out of the second day practice today? Um, very, very good practice today. They, um, I, Elliot was on uh, WIP earlier, and he was speaking about it, and he was very impressed with it. Um, I'm, I'm really excited, man, about Jalen Carter, um, Nolan Smith. You know, they said these guys, these two guys are just like really, really, and this is coming from veteran players like Fletcher Cox and um, uh, the other offensive players, uh, offensive linemen um, such as Jordan Malata and Jason Kelsey. These guys are 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 very excited for these young men, you know. So I'm excited. I just, if I could just turn the damn clock, I want first the, the game to start now, our first game, you know. But we got to go through these practices and get better and get these guys acclimated and ready to you know, to start, to start this season. But it's just very, very refreshing to see the youth, the speed, the the talent. I, this is by far the most talented team that I've ever seen that he was at. Well, as far as Carter's concerned, I don't know um, who wrote it, but it was an independent uh, journal that happened to be at the practice, and he tweeted out, that Carter was manhandling the two-time Pro Bowl lineman yeah, and just working him. So, you know, again, I you know, I appreciate Elliot. He, he's usually very fair and balanced. Um, but when you hear somebody outside of both organizations that's just an independent journalist saying something like that, I'm like, okay, if he's putting him on skates, a two-time Pro Bowler, I, li- I like that. I like that he came out today and, and put in the work and, and so he's not – I'm expecting a lot out of him because, again, of the joint defense. Uh, you were talking about somebody tweeted you trying to talk about Nolan Smith and how he looked small or whatever like that. And I'm like, by watching a season game, some guys are going to flash, yes. But the other younger guys are not playing with the first team defense. And the way we rotate and the way we move, good luck. You think he's underway? You think he's slow? Good luck. Because it's not just him, it's an orchestra on the defense. And when you got a push on the right, he's coming off the left. You got a push on the left, somebody else is coming off the right. And then they just come in ways because, as you said, even with our secondary and our DBs, good. You want to have a nickel? We we have a nickel now that we can plug and play dudes in there and swap them out so they're fresh. Because, you know, we all know it's a passing league and everybody's trying to go downfield. But I feel like we have the horses to keep up with that. And the Kobe hasn't gotten a chance to play, so we've seen him because he's been injured. But I I can't stand how much people are nitpicking about this kid because, again, it's just such a small sample size. But you watch him on college, and I watched him in seven minutes of that Tennessee game last year, and the only guy that was flashing was him. Ball, Nicobe. Ball, Nicobe. Ball. Wherever the ball was, Nicobe was there. 
so I'm not worried about him. I just want to get healthy and get right. There's a reason they got him as the mic. I feel like he's sm- smart enough to, to run the defense and, and lead the men. But the whole, we didn't see him play. He way. He's ducking people. I'm like, why, what, what are you talking about? Why would he duck anybody? We're trying to go into the season healthy. We're trying to go into the season healthy. And Howie, again, you, you bring a couple of veteran guys in here as backup guys on the minimum. It's smart. It's just smart. People got to learn. I'm not really got to learn because you have it or you don't. And that's the eye fatality. If you could, uh, uh, Nolan Smith, the guy says to me that he's too small and he's getting pushed around like her. First of all, I don't know what game you were looking at. He wasn't getting pushed around at all. You know, Nolan Smith went into the combine at two, uh, I think 40, 239. And that's, that was basically to run a faster 40. Now he sets put the weight that he wants to play with on. So he's actually the same size, height, and weight as uh, Micah Parson from Dallas Cowboys. So, and so you're going to tell me he's, he's too small to him? Yeah. You know, this guy is strong. He's been doing it since high school. You know, um, he's a real dog. Uh, Nicobe Dean, the same. You're not going to see – when you got a guy that is in charge of uh, setting up the defense, okay, calling the plays – He's not really concerned about making these splash plays that you're looking for in practice and in the training camp. That's going to happen in the game where he's now not going to be teaching on the field. He's not going to be uh, making sure that you're doing your job. He does that in practice and training camp because once you get into a real game, you know, we're all – it's it's still your job. Yeah. You know, you know he's not looking – to do the job of the outside, uh, this the, the outside linebacker or the weak side linebacker, you know what I'm saying? So he's more focused on uh, his or his his protection with the middle as the middle linebacker. So I think people need to understand that. I think you know you got fans, and then you got fans that know the game, that know what they're looking at. So the ones that don't know the game, that's just sitting there drinking beer, they're smoking and everything, they kind of mess things up when it's time to talk about the game because you don't really understand what you're what you're looking at. Yeah, it's it's annoying. And I like get it. everybody's got their own opinion and things like that. But I just try to keep it like real. And again, you, you can even have a different opinion than me, but just give me a good reason that I should at least listen to it. Because sometimes people just say things that are crazy. Uh so Eagles looking good. We're excited about it. Uh I'm gonna get get you on this and then we can wrap it up. James Hart in China. He said that Darren Moore, he lied to him, and he will never play for an organization that he works at again. Are you, are you firing Darren Moore today? Yes. And it's not because of that. I was firing Darren Moore according to how the James Harding um, escapade played out. Um, coming into the whole situation, um, our goal was to unload Ben Simmons. Okay, we we managed to get a star player for Ben Simmons, which was James Hardy. And I called him James Hardy, you know, because yeah. he hardly impressed me. Um, is the plan was for him to come here, give us that year, and if he fit, we keep him. If he didn't, we get rid of him. So we're a year late. I would have gotten rid of him last year. Wouldn't have brought it into this year. And at that moment, with the things that um, Daryl Morey has done, is firing worthy. You're not making this organization better. It's not better. Somebody has to be held accountable for that. Oftentimes, it's your head coach. Well, guess what? We fired him. Then it's your next guy, which is your GM. Now you have a player that you uh, signed to a, a one-year contract, what have you, you brought him here, you had confidence in him, he even turned on you. So, yeah, it's time for overall. It's time for a change. I wish we could change the ownership, but that that's something else. That's, I'm saying that's, this organization is riding on autopilot. It really has no leader. So, I hate to say it, for people that's Sixer fans, I'm a Sixer fan as well. But 
I can't ride with this team until it has some real uh, identifiable leadership. Right now, it's running on autopilot. So that's what I'm starting with. I want Josh Harris to sell a team. You're not going to sell a team. Then Maury's getting fired. Elton Brand's getting fired. He's just out here stealing money and collecting the check. And people forget he's even there until you start bringing up Maury getting fired. Then you already got rid of the coach, who I thought was a clown panda. And then James Hart. I don't care. Move him for shekels because you're going to have two open max slots next year. And then you go sit down with Joel and Bean. You say, look, stop being like Maury and, and trolling on the Internet. Just shut up. You got a max contract. We're going to pay you. We love you. You're the MVP here. And my goodness, today is not the day to stand up for a player. You want to stand up for James stripping Dip Harden? You must be out of your mammy jammy mind. And I'm trying not to cuss because I get so mad about it. I would cuss way too much. This is my show. I can say what the LL Cool Jab want. But I'm just saying, I can't stand the fact that Joel is making me upset. I'm already annoyed at you, bro. But now you're coming out here taking Philadelphia out of your thing. Uh, P.J. Tucker, he's been riding the D and James Harden for forever and getting free checks with him. I get him standing up for him. But you, you should stuff for Jimmy Butler. You're the boy you was crying over if you wanted to do something to change your Twitter bio. Not James Strippin' Dip, okay? This dude, uh, he promises that he's going to be an MVP next year. If you don't shut your mouth, I'll put everything OG Wade has on it, okay? And OG got a lot. I, ain't put, my, I put everything OG on the fact that this dude is not going to be MVP and nothing next year. Not even top five considerations. You're old, James. You suck. You're slow. And you don't care about a championship. You care about throwing money at strippers, okay? And you need more cash because you're throwing too much at this ass. That's your problem, okay? You're never going to win a championship anywhere, and nobody wants you. You are an open free agent. You could have opted out, but nobody wanted you, bro. And now you're trying to force your way into the Clippers? Guess what? They're a trash head organization, too, today with another that's trying to build their own building. Good luck, okay? But coming here, it's so frustrating to be a sixth trip. Got season tickets, can't do it. I'm trying to parlay them all and go get uh, union tickets and go and go back to the Flyers. At least, I know the Flyers suck, at least they're trying to reboot every once in a while. The Sixers are just in this horrible cycle of not getting anything done, and there is no leadership, OG Wade. We're in a terrible, terrible situation, and I am obviously upset about it. I mean, I I have a lot of answers for things, but the, the answer for this organization, is, is, it, it's not like it's beyond me. It's just that it's so much that it's, it's not realistic. I know that these um, stockbroker um, owners – are going to sell the team. No. You know what I'm saying? So uh, the the next best thing is how do we try to salvage what we can to go into this season? This season was so promising to me is because in my years of watching the NBA, the teams that win the the, the championship or even get there is the, the con- that has the continuity, okay? Meaning that didn't make any a lot of changes. This team realistically, and I've been saying this for a very long time, and I challenge anybody to prove me different. It needs five people to score in double figures on a, on a night in and night out basis. Too often we have three, four. With the games that we look great in, that's what we have the five people in double figures. Just go and look at any game. So my solution would be to somehow trade James Harding to the Indiana Pacers, try to get either uh, T.J. McConnell, uh, Miles Turner, uh, this one, us uh, two other players, Buddy Hill, Buddy Hill, or the uh, the boy that we were supposed to trade for Ben Simmons at first, which was uh, Hollenberg. Yeah, you know, but. I don't know how realistic that is, but if we want to stay with the reality and stay with what we have, we can actually do that. Bring Jay Hardy back. All I'm asking him to do is give me 16 to 17 points a game. I'm asking uh, uh, Tyreek Maxey, give me 16 points a game. I'm asking uh, Tobias Harris, give me 12 to 15 a game. Joel, give me 25. These are numbers, bro, that, can, that is doable. And then the rest of the team... You're six man. Give me 11. The rest of the, the team, give me 20. That's 121 points a game. J- James Harden's never playing another game for the six. 
Yes, yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, if we yeah, if we could, I should do it. Yeah. You know, you know, because this is the team that did not make a whole lot of changes. Everybody else in the East made major changes, so it's going to take them time to gel. We can get out in front of that, and and the Eastern Conference is weak. That's the other issue. The Eastern Conference is weak, but again, uh, it's okay. So you fire more, which we both agree he should be fired in general anyway. But now, what what? A, you're giving too much power to James Harden at this age. He got he wanted the coach gone. Coach's gone. And Darren Morey, as much as he's like, oh, he's a liar, bro, you've been trying to best friend finesse this guy who's your boss to get you paid for over a decade now. And the one time that you suck in the playoffs and choke again and do what you do, it goes to ownership. And they're like, I can't give him four years max deal. Are you crazy? We're about to have two max slots available. So I know ownership shut that down. This, this is much as, because Maury, not for nothing, he is his bootlicker. He want to give him anything he can. You know, hugging and kissing him on the airplane and all that kind of stuff, going out to the wine on the boat. All the things. He's just a nerd with the dude taking him to the strip club. I know he wanted to give him the money, but they weren't allowing him to do it. So you want to come out and say, Maury's a liar. You're a liar. You're telling me you're going to be MVP next year. You're a liar. You choke. In every single playoff series you've ever been in in your life, two for 17, two shots in the second half of games, sevens. Like, you've done this through your whole career. So you are a liar. Don't tell me that this dude's liar because that's what GMs do. That's what managers do. Mm -hmm. it, they, they finesse you. And again, it's just like how he has to go in and, yeah, you got to restructure. You know, the whole thing with um our quarterback last year in all season, like, Slay. The slate come out and say, oh, how he lied to me. He promised me. Hey, bro, the market is the market. This is what's going on. Go check it out. Go go down to the grocery store and see what they give you for them eggs. Oh, wow, they ain't doing it for you? I, I see what I was trying to give you was fair to it. It's not a lie so much as the market also dictates what someone else can do for you. And no one wanted Jay. And James Harden usually doesn't even have uh, um, a manager. He picked up one in December, J January, whatever, agent, an agent coming up. So he picked one up because usually he's just out here. You know, he has somebody look over stuff. But, dude, this is what the market's giving you. Nobody wanted you. You were available. This is what it is. And now we're just in this untenable situation that is the 76ers that I've had to deal with for the last 10, 12 years of my life. And I'm stupid for spending money and going to the games and buying jerseys. It stops today. Yeah, I agree. All right. These were girls. Yeah. Yeah. At least we agree on some. Oh, the Phillies are on fire. The Phillies are on fire. Uh, Trey Turner is doing his thing. Everybody else is doing their thing. Now, at least when they lose, I don't feel bad. I, I don't know how much you watch baseball, OG, but all, all year long, it's been like the worst roller coaster in the world because, like, the end of the game comes, it's like it's the ninth inning, and they'll be down by three. And I'm like, oh, man, we're about to lose. And then, boom, walk off on run. I'm like, yeah. Or we end up actually losing, and I cry like, for two hours afterwards. There was too much up and down. So to have this nice little uptick uh, where there's still some bumps in the road, but just seeing everybody being positive and hitting together and doing well, going towards the end of the season gives me great hope. And it's something that Philadelphia did uh, for, for the Phillies. Yeah, I, I watch a little bit of baseball. Um, the Phillies, I mean, people have to understand that it's the same thing every year. You know what I'm saying? Like, how are you surprised or disappointed when the same thing happens every year. Baseball is one of the, is not one of the most humbling sport. Yeah. In all of sports. It will humble you like that. Everybody was upset with Turner because he wasn't showing out and everything like this man wasn't trying to. And then you gotta understand he's a real human being. These guys come here in one year, they get all this money, and now they have to go and set their families up. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Bryce Harper went through the same exact thing. Cassiano. This first year here. Everybody was like, well, when is Bryce going to show up? He got all that money there. You got to let these guys get settled in and let them feel their way through it. And then you'll, you know, you'll get something out of it. But can't be uh, wanting to get rid of the guys that he's bum and he's this and that. No, he's not. You wouldn't have paid him. He wouldn't have even signed him. Better yet, you wouldn't even have wanted him to come here. If he wasn't the player that that he that he is, so I'm glad to see uh, Trey Turner come out of that little folk that he was in, and now the team 
overall has been galvanized and it's worked. And I, I'm not a nurse, so I'm not going to do it, but I, I would like to do a study on when guys go to a new organization, when you don't have a family, it's much easier to hit the ground running. But any of these guys that are married with children or the, the wives are expecting, uh, it, it's it's a whole different ball game. And it's the same thing with um, Lorenz, the day he was here and he hit the suit no hitter. The only reason his mother was here is because he's moving into a new house with a nine-month-old newborn and he's got to work all day. And his wife is there alone in the city she doesn't know. So he flew his mom out like, hey, could you help get the house, the apartment set up and get everything moved out of here? Because I can't do it logistically because I'm still working. It's the middle of the season. So she got to be there to see her son. Because normally she wouldn't have been there to see him play. She's out in California. So, yes, it is a family. There is a family dynamic and there is life that goes on that some guys have to get around. And uh, I'm just happy that it turned around. My last question is, do you care about soccer at all? No. Okay, because Messi's in town. He is the greatest layer to that or live out of the universe of the world. I heard Elliot Shore Parks tweet uh, the greatest athlete is I'm like, the, the greatest athlete right now, Jalen Hurts, the Duke. That's 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 the greatest athlete playing sports right now. Well, you're wrong about a lot of things, and that's what yeah. well. Messi is, Messi, I'm not a big soccer guy, but there is something to being the top of your field. That's nice. It's just, it's just, a, it's just the top of the field. And I love Jalen Hurts. You know, 50 people <laughs> shins and all that. Oh! Hey, look, you didn't bite the ankles and kick your shins. That's, that's, that's the Lions motto, brother. That's how they start rolling out there in Detroit. That's how you get these wins going. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's funny. Like, I, I, don't, I don't care that much about him, per se, because I do watch uh, soccer just because I coach with my kid. But it's just funny how, again, when you're, you're one person and you pay this one person, the rest of the team isn't that great. But, you know, it, it's, just, it's just a funny thing. But everybody's selling their tickets anyway, so we'll see how many Philly fans are actually in the building uh, going on tonight. Uh, that's it for us. Uh, make sure you follow OG. His Twitter is going to obviously be up here it's on the screen and then uh, linked in the show notes. His uh, son's still sitting over here uh, resting from practice. He's about to get an ice bath when he get home. He's going to be, oh, he pulled me in trouble. You don't know it's going to It's going to be a problem for him. Uh, then that's about it. Check us out. Subscribe everywhere you see it. Later.